Good morning. Welcome to Lapeer Community Church. I'm really glad you're here. It was people are um, getting online and getting connected. I want to take you know a little bit of time here, but um, before we pray and get started, but um, we are in a reading plan that I had put together to cover all the stories from the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament. And if you're interested in that reading plan, you can find it at lapeercc.org, where you can download the reading plan. And it looks like this, and that will um, give you. Uh, each week by week where we're at. Right now we're in week 13, which is in Numbers. It's the first time we enter the book of Numbers. And so this is in the first five books of the Bible with the books of Moses. Um, missing a lot here in Numbers. And <clears throat> the reason is, is we're not covering the laws. We're just covering the stories. And so we jump all the way to uh, Numbers chapter 11 through chapter 17 today. And um, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about um, leadership and uh, and about followership. And uh, we will um, kind of get started on that. But let's go ahead and pray, and then um, we'll continue with this morning's message. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word and um, all the things that you teach us. I thank you for, um, you know, leaving us to guesswork that is about who you are and um, whether you love us or not. Um, how do we live in this world? All that we need to know about living in this world and our relationship with you is found in the pages of the Bible. And so, Father, I thank you that you gave it to us so that we might um, know these things to be true and trust you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Father, I pray that you give us ability to understand that you would help us um, conform or, or transform our minds to the pattern that you created us to be. And that um, we would live a life that glorifies you and that we could enjoy you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we um, left the last week's message where they made the golden calf at the, the foot of the mountain that Moses uh, was up on where God gave him the Ten Commandments, and they broke that commandment, <clears throat> he ends up breaking the commandments on the ground and going up and making more and then and writing a, a, the bulk of the Mosaic Law um, that the Jews followed for centuries um, in that place. And um, they also made the tabernacle, which is a moving temple, to take with them. And, um, <clears throat> and then um, today, we start going all the way to the promised land, where they reject God over and over and over. But they, on the way, so they've been in there for about a year. There's about 2 million Jews that, uh, or Hebrews that Moses is leading from Egypt all the way to Palestine. And... Um, in Numbers, in this section in Numbers, he just encounters resistance and resistance and resistance and complaining and it just over and over and over and it comes in many forms. And so if you if you had opened your Bibles to um, Numbers chapter 11, we'll just start there with, you're right at the beginning a little bit just to kind of show this. This is where they, they've already been given um, food that comes down from heaven on the ground and it's manna, and they eat manna every day. They found different ways to cook it and make it, but they also um, have plenty of water, and they have manna. They have all that they need food-wise, plus they have their animals. And um, But they start to crave other food, the Bible says. And so Numbers chapter 11, they start complaining, and all we have is this manna. You know, So start look down to verse 4 in chapter 11. It says, The rabble with them began to crave other food, and again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. I remember fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, also cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. And then they start criticizing Moses. And Moses, you know, falls apart before God. So God, how do I lead these people? They're, they're, they just... I can't feed these people meat. I can't give them enough food. You've led me out. To lead these people, I'm, it's an impossible task. And God, if you'll read through that story, God you know, goes ahead and gives them uh, quail, where they just eat quail until they're sick of quail. And it doesn't matter what food you like. If you eat too much of it, you'll be sick of it. Um, but And I can kind of understand maybe being tired of manna. But the reality is, is God is providing for them, and they're acting like um, a bunch of chil you know, children just weeping and wailing because you don't like your food, that's a bit much. But um, the, the, the 
resistance to whatever God's provision is, it's not enough. They want something more. They always want more than what they've been given. And they always go to Moses to complain. And they complain about him. And they then want to go back to Egypt, which was where they were enslaved. Because they had free food, you know. And it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense. But it's over and over and over. You're going to see him complain. Then you go to the next chapter. And now it's his own family's turns against him. Um, and if you'll turn to chapter 12, verse 1, you have Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because this Cushite, because he had a Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Verse 2, has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoke through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And I want to include that for a reason, because you have this leader and then you have followers complaining about the leader. And um, <clears throat> it doesn't matter, you know, <clears throat> that God can speak to anybody. He also chooses leaders, and they, he didn't choose Miriam or Aaron to lead. He chose Moses, and Moses is the one that has a responsibility. And, and it's odd that people would want to lead. I mean, I, I used to want to be in politics for a while, and... Um, I never did because I knew I was supposed to be in ministry, but there was something alluring about um, being the center of attention and having power, and yet that power comes with such a toll. I think every person who is elected president ages two decades in a four years. It's just uh, amazing. When you just watch them, they just age really fast, and I just think it's such stress and such pressure that you have to get everything right. And when you do get everything right, people criticize you anyway. And so it doesn't matter who's president. There's always half a country, at least half a country, complaining about what the president's doing. And it doesn't matter whether Republican or Democrat. They're, it just, they're, you're, you're not gonna please half the nation. And, um, and sometimes even more than half will, will be complaining. And um, you can do things right, you can do things wrong. You're, you're gonna have, uh, it's just such a burden. And um, you can't, you know, we heard the things you can't please everybody. Well, you can't even please half of everybody, really. And <clears throat> so Moses is, is getting complaints from the entire country of people. And then he gets complaints from his own family. And they want to say, we need a new leader. And um, if you go to the next story, and then I'll, I'll kind of follow up with that, is um, the next story goes all the way to chapter 14. And... Um, this is a pivotal point in the whole story of the Exodus. When they're leaving Egypt, they get, finally they get to Palestine. This is well after a year after they left Egypt, and they send 12 spies into the land to look out the fortifications, look what kind of, are they strong, are they weak, what kind of crops do they produce, what's the land like, where is the good land, where isn't it? And they, they spy out the whole land, and they come back, and 10 of the 12 spies say, the land's awesome. Well, they all, all 12 spies say the land is awesome. The fruit's amazing. The produce, everything. It's a land of milk and honey. And then um, <clears throat> it truly is awesome. But the people who live there are giants and they'll squash us like bugs. Basically saying we're like grasshoppers to them. And um, two of them, Caleb and Joshua, Joshua's uh, Moses' right-hand man actually takes over his leadership when Moses is gone, uh, 40 years later, um, say, no, let, let, God has given us this land. Let's go take it. And Moses wants them to go take it. It's theirs. But because they're afraid of dying, look at verse uh, chapter 14, verse 1. All that night, the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is it that the Lord bringing us out of the land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose another leader and go back to Egypt. The reality is they never had the right to choose a leader. They didn't choose Moses to begin with. God chose Moses. And um, this is not a democracy. Um, as much as we in our culture love democracy, that we can choose our people, our leaders, from the people, by the people, for the people, um, they didn't get to choose. 
God chose Moses to be the leader and they had to submit to that leader and they failed over and over and over. And for the leader, that's pretty overwhelming. And, and for me, as I think about it as being a pastor, I'm a leader, um, and I know God called me to be a pastor, wanted me to be a pastor, but there are so many times that I am plagued by self-doubt. And the self-doubt is amplified by people who disagree with whatever choices I think we're supposed to be doing, you know. And, and really, a church is not a democracy either. We don't vote for a new pastor every four years. We, we, we have a pastor that's supposed to be called and called to a certain church. Now, I think that the hard part, well, for the, for the pastor, for me, it's hard because no matter what, I do whether I do the right thing the thing that's right and what God wants us to do or the thing that really isn't the right thing to do it doesn't matter I always have people that'll say this is we should be doing something different we should be acting like this other church and our pastor over there because there's so many things to be compared to there's so many different pastors and um and we have people that come into the church initially that, that love me because they're comparing to me to their former pastor that they didn't like. And so, you know, for that comparison favors me, at least for a while. But the longer I lead, the, the, the longer people follow in, in me as a shepherd for our local church and I lead, the more opportunities it is for my faults to show and also um, for the things I do right to look like they're foolish or to to seem like they're not the right decision. And um, and it becomes really hard. So if I take like just the current situation, our church isn't open yet. We haven't opened, but there's many churches that did. And um, it'd be really easy for people to look at me and look at the leadership of our church and say, why don't you open up? Lots of other churches have. And and I could say, we could, yep, everybody else is opening, let's open. But at the end of the day, I have a responsibility to say, God, do you want us to open? And then not do what everybody else is doing if God doesn't want me to. But it's hard because it's hard um, because you start thinking about, well, just be, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should just open back up. I kind of felt like God wanted us to just stay the course for a while, but maybe we're supposed to just open up and go back to normal because other churches are. But if you look at this passage, especially the one here in um, Numbers chapter 14, 12 spies ran out. 10 of them said, we're, t we're not strong enough to attack the um, the inhabitants will be squashed like bugs. Two of them said, no, God wants us to take this land. He's given to us, let's go. And the two were right, the 10 were wrong. So following the majority isn't always the right thing to do. And so to look around what everybody else is doing shouldn't be the guideline for what we do. And so I have to maintain a course that says, you know, what we need to do is what God wants us to do. But it comes sometimes with a price that people question whether you're making the right decisions or not. And it's really hard. And then in my own head, I question, am I making the right decision? It's really hard. So to spend more time in prayer is all I, I can do for a decision like this. Because I'm not going to read in the Bible somewhere. As much as I love the Bible, it tells me how to live in this world. It doesn't tell me what to do in a season of pandemic. It doesn't tell me what to do when there is a... Um, you know, a modern pandemic when it comes to church services. It's just not there. I have to seek discernment from God by spending time with him and with other people just that's, that are praying with me. And um, and so when we do this, and this message isn't about you know, our decision to not meet, it's just an example. But the reality is, is that it is hard because there's self-doubt then it's amplified by other people that want to speak and say, this is a, not the right thing to do. And it makes you sometimes just want to quit. It just makes you, God, why do you have me in this position? I, I would much rather work for somebody else who tells me whether to go to work or not go to work. And just throw me in a factory somewhere and I'll it'd be so much easier than to lead. And that I understand where Moses is going, God, why did you give me all these people? It's overwhelming. I can't do this. And um, <clears throat> at the same time, those those Hebrews were supposed to follow and and the the when when Miriam and and Aaron complained that Moses didn't pick a Hebrew wife, he he God spoke to us. We could lead just as well. Well, they, he God didn't choose them, and he punished Miriam especially. But the 
<clears throat> the thing is that what God said, if you went back to this passage here, this is in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now Moses was very a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. That humility is the quality which God seemed to call Moses by. That he wasn't the one that knew all the answers and he wasn't the one that was going to demand how things go. He wasn't like the strong leader that knew how to do everything. No, he was a humble man that was filled with self-doubt. And um, <clears throat> you see that all the way through the story, that he's, he doesn't speak well. God, please choose somebody else. He's, he's not the one desiring to be in charge. He's not the one that you know, ran for president because he's the one who knows how to do everything. No, he's the one who says, I'm not the right person. God, pick somebody else, please, because I'm, I'm not capable. And, um, and that's, that's one of the things that the scripture says he appreciates about Moses. He's humble. He isn't the one that's seeking power. He isn't the one that wants to make all the decisions, which makes him stand before God and say, God, give me direction and give me guidance because I need to know what you want so I can lead these people because I'm fully un incapable of doing it on my own. And um, one of the things I've noticed about ministry the last couple of years is all of the leadership conferences I've gone to, humility is not one of the things that's embraced or prized or anything. Self-doubt is not something that's seen as a good thing. It's like, it's not seen as like, questioning my own abilities is not no we're supposed to have it all together come up with a plan you know devise systems and ways to get everything done and prove you know and take the take the world by storm evangelize the whole planet you know and they're they're just they're human they're conventional human wisdom it's just it's just man's ideas when god wants to do something it's obvious that god does but sometimes you just have to wait on him and it's really hard because while we're waiting it looks like we're not doing the things that work. And, and so it puts humility, saying, I, I don't know, is, is really a tough thing to do in a culture that, that wants to follow people who knows what to do. And, um, but that's not, that's not Moses here. Moses is somebody that is like, God, I don't want to do this. And I, I, I was speaking with somebody yesterday about this whole place, you know, of leading from a place of weakness and not knowing that, you know, and, and in the end, in the end, what I want and what I dream of is, is doing ministry that God is actually leading. And it's so obvious that it's God. So if, if things go right, I want God to get all the credit, you know, because he's the one who did it instead of me where it didn't used to be that way but but also i said you know if everything goes wrong i definitely want god to get all the credit you know but usually if things go don't look like they go right i get the credit you know uh, at which is not credit at all it's criticism and and so what happens is 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 that i'm supposed to lead in faith that god is the one who's leading and then people are supposed to follow me if you're christians Trusting that God is the one who's leading, not me. God is the one who's leading me. And sometimes that, that faith in God is really tough because you see the human leader. Now, there are times when there are human leaders you're not supposed to follow. And I've had pastors that, you know, not, I don't think they were worthy of following. And maybe humility is the thing you look for. If they're not humble, then maybe, maybe that's not somebody you're supposed to follow. Certainly somebody that's not going to follow the scriptures. It's not somebody you want to follow, you know, somebody who's figuring out how to do everything and is not relying on prayer, probably not supposed to follow, you know, but, but you have to spend time in prayer. Say, God, where do you want me? What is your will for me? Where am I supposed to be inside your kingdom to do your work? Not, not to, to follow a leader that makes me feel good because I like the programs they have or whatever they're doing is like when you follow a leader, it's supposed to, you're supposed to follow the leader God calls you to follow. And, um, and here's the thing that's really interesting. Living in a democracy, we tend to think we get to choose who we follow. That's not scriptural at all. As a matter of fact, we'll tend to choose a leader as long as they're doing what we want them to do. As soon as they are voting for a new guy, leaving that church, going somewhere else, and your spiritual leader is supposed to have authority over you, and this makes me very uncomfortable, but it is the reality of the scriptures. If you open up the Bible to chapter 13 of Hebrews, this is what it says about your pastor. This is, this is what the writer of Hebrews in the Bible says to the average person in the church. This starts in verse 17, Hebrews 13, uh, verse 17 and 18. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. So I, I will be held accountable for the people I lead. 
whether I've taught you well, whether I've um, chastised you when you need to be chastised, when I point out things in your life that isn't godly, I'm supposed to do those things. And you may not like those, you might not like what I'm saying or what I'm teaching, but the thing is, is that I have a responsibility to teach the scriptures whether you like what's in them or not. And if I don't, I'm the one who's held accountable. I get held to a higher standard. So there's, then it goes on, I get, give an account, and then it says, do, do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that wouldn't be of no benefit to you. Now look at what happened with Moses. His work was not a joy because they opposed him in everything they did. And then it says, verse 18, pray for us. I, I definitely need your prayers in a time like this, especially to know the right decision to make when there's pressure and there's a polarized nation, polarized people politically and everything else to know God's will in the spite of what's going on is the number one thing I need to know. So pray for me. So it says verse 18, pray for us. We are sure that we will have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way or pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. That is my desire. I want to live honorably. I want to know I've done all that God's will has done and that I would be the best shepherd, leader for those who follow me and that um, I'd also not shy away from telling you the truth. And there have been many times in my ministry that I have. I've been afraid. And, um, you know, so that self-doubt. And so... Where your role in is in following is you need to have a pastoral leader, somebody that you submit to. Who's your pastor? Who's your pastor? So if you're watching this and you don't actually have a pastor, you should. You should have a pastor who knows you, knows what you're like, knows the way you live. And when you color outside the lines, that pastor is strong enough, loves you enough to tell you, hey, you're coloring outside the lines. The scripture says this is wrong. Your relationship with God is not right. And, um, You'd rather that than have a pastor let you live in a broken relationship with God who'll never say anything as long as you're buddies. That ain't going to work. You have to have somebody that's going to get right in a loving way, tell you, this is what following God looks like and what you're doing doesn't look like you're following God at all. And um, a pastor will pray for you and a pastor who will um, be there for you. And, and to some degree, Moses cannot be there for two million people. But he prayed he was following God's will, and he led them well in, in the face of their criticism. They had a real gift from God in the person of Moses and didn't know it the whole time. And so I've asked a few others. I haven't done this very often, but who is your pastoral authority? What authority are you going to sit under? And whether you like what he says or not, are you going to follow that? Now, if, if he's not humble and they're arrogant and they're, they're demanding or, you know, they're, it's all about them, okay, fine. But, but if you have a humble pastor somewhere that... that really chooses to lead for your benefit will you submit to their authority will you will you take their direction and guidance and follow them because they're there for your benefit the scripture says and so um as we look to the scriptures about how to follow him part of it is 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 placing your life under the direction of a pastor and that is what's best for you according to the word of god it is an, a, a responsibility that I'm very uncomfortable with, to tell you the truth. I, it really makes me uncomfortable. I'd, anyways, rather do something else. Um, just be, Not just because I'm afraid of the judgment, but just because I'm afraid of what if I don't do this well? What if I don't? What if I tell you something that you don't like and you leave? Or, um, or you get angry with me? Or I don't meet an expectation you have that... Maybe I'm not supposed to meet or whatever, but you think I should. Or what if I just fail just because I'm a human being and I fail? And So all of those things give me, really, makes me insecure sometimes. And so, uh, but it is the position of leadership. I'm not alone. Moses is very insecure. I'm pretty good company if that's the case. And so um, if, if I am your pastor, I pray that you pray for me and that you trust me and that um, we go through these things together. And um, so I'd like to pray for you, and I hope you have a fantastic morning. Continue to read um, your, your passages of Scripture, or catch up if you can. Become familiar with the Word of God so that you have a better direction when you're living in doubt. Are we doing the right things? Are you doing the right things? Your best bet is to follow Scripture, pray, and be in communication with your pastor and your, your church family. And um, together we can um, follow God as a community.
It wasn't like all the tribes were going on their own way. They were all together. So we can um, plow through life together and uh, follow God's will. And maybe one day he would tell us we did this well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for um, this teaching this morning and then the recording of all of Moses' story that we might learn from it and follow your guidance and uh, walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you have a great morning. Thank you.